<clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, so uh, today is uh, the February uh, the, the, the 21st, and today is the birthday of this remarkable uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch architect, the father of uh, nothing else but the father of uh, modern uh, Dutch architecture. So here he is, Hendrik Petrus Perlache. I checked again how to pronounce correctly Berlache, and I'm still not sure I do. And uh, through the Zoom system, I don't know if my uh, attempt at um, uh, being scrupulous about this is uh, noticeable. Anyway, I'll try my best. Was a Dutch architect born the 21st of February, 1856, about 20 or 21 years. Um, or 22 years uh, now, no, no. Le Corbusier was born, I think, in 18, uh, I always confuse, 1887 or 1878. Anyway, he was older than Le Corbusier and died in, uh, in August before the war. Uh, good for him that he died before the war. Verlach has studied architecture at the Zurich Institute of Technology for three years between 1875 and 1878, after which he traveled extensively for three years through Europe. In 1880s, he formed a partnership in the Netherlands with Theodore Sanders, which produced a mixture of practical and utopian projects. Here I will stop for a second and I will ask, what utopian projects are you doing? A published author, Berlache held memberships in various architectural societies, including uh, Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne, Siam I. Berlache was influenced by the neo-Romanesque brickwork architecture of Henry Hobson Richardson, the one who together with Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, Louis Sullivan are considered the uh, you know, the, the, the trinity of, uh, of uh, you know, the founders of modern architecture in the United States and of the combination of structures of iron seen with a brick, with brick of the castle of the three echoes of Domenici Montaner. This influence is visible in his design for the Amsterdam Commodities Exchange for which he would also draw on the ideas of Viollet le Duc as you can see, this architect, and not only this architect, plunged into the past, was aware of what was happening both in the past and in, during his present. The load-bearing bare brick walls and the notion of the primacy of space and of walls as the creators of form would be the constitutive principles of the let me see, I, I, I will not attempt to read this, so I will allow you to read it for yourselves. I really have a problem with the, with the, with the, with the Dutch language. A visit Berlach made to the United States in 1911. So this was rather late, you know, he was born in uh, 1856. So uh, at 55, he made a trip to the United States, greatly affected his architecture. From then on, the org organic architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright would be a significant influence. Lectures he gave when he returned to Europe would help to disseminate Wright's thoughts in Germany. Uh, a notable overseas commission was the 1916th Holland House built as offices for a Dutch shipping company in uh, Barry Street in the city of London behind Norman Foster's 30 St. Mary Axia of 2003. We are going to see that project. Consider the father of modern architecture in the Netherlands and the intermediary between the traditionalists and the modernists, Berlach's theories inspired most Dutch architectural groups of the 1920s, including the traditionalists, the Amsterdam School, the Steel, and the new objectivists. He received the British Riba Royal Gold Medal in 1932. He died in August 1934 in The Hague. His son, also named Hendrik Petrus Perlache, was an astronomer in Royal Magnetic and Meteorological Observatory in Batavia, Dutch East Indies, now Jakarta in Indonesia, whose name has been immortalized as a lunar crater. Great. But 
let's uh, let's uh, dwell a little bit on this. So he influenced very diverse groups of architects: the Amsterdam School, the Still, the New Objectivists, and the Traditionalists. So he was quite a personality, being able to influence uh, such almost divergent groups um, uh, of architectural groups. And since I think it's important to stress the, the significance of the past for us today, I would ask the, my, my, uh, my honorable Romanian audience, what groups do you um, take part in? Okay, let's move forward. Here was the man. Uh, and he does look like a serious and sensitive man and he, you know with a, an appreciable um, aptitude i would say for introspection um, we are going to see uh, most of his important works the most famous being the one here on the right in amsterdam uh, but we'll right there here he is again uh, you know a dreamer i think he was a dreamer and I truly think great architects are just that, dreamers. Because if you don't dream, how are you going to arrive at the poetry that great architecture is? You have to be a dreamer. You look at him, you know, he is clearly daydreaming, clearly. Anyway, maybe I'm wrong. No, I'm not wrong. The influence, he was influenced by the architecture of H.H. H. Richardson, and uh, this is a lesser known architect, but uh, unjustly so, because he was uh, truly a great North American architect. And I'll just show a few examples of Richardson architecture, so we can see the relationship with, uh, with the works of uh, Hendrik uh, Berlacher. Uh, this is a church in Boston, uh, built by H.H. H. Richardson, which is also on the cover of, uh, of a volume dedicated to modern architecture that Francesco Del Coche, Del Coche and uh, Manfredo Tafuri wrote on modern architecture, a series uh, from the series of 18 volumes, uh, the history, the, the world history, uh, the history of world architecture. Another building by, uh, by a massive, uh, large building built by H.H. H. Richardson. Uh, another one, H.H. H. Richardson, was inspired apparently by uh, uh, Romanesque uh, architecture. Most architects, of course, prefer to be inspired by Renaissance architecture. In the 19th century, many were inspired by the Gothic, but he was inspired by what was prior to the Gothic, and that is the Romanesque architecture. And here he was. Unfortunately, he died young, but he built a lot, truly a lot. And uh, I love the way he looks. He looks romantic. He looks uh, uh, unusual, uh, unconventional. Uh, I'm, I'm very sad he died young, but he built a lot. So again, the triad uh, of, of uh, three geniuses, uh, let's call them this way, with this problematic word, geniuses in North, uh, North American uh, foundational uh, architecture were right. Well, actually, first H.H. H. Richardson, then Louis Sullivan, and then Frank Lloyd Wright, the three of them. Uh, another building by H.H. H. Richardson, and you can see in the massivity and the kind of architecture he built, you see the influence of uh, Romanesque architecture. He was an excellent architect, he truly was. Now we, we, we look at some works by uh, Berlacher. We begin with an early work from 1894, the Villa Heymans in Groningen. Uh, and you see there is a, a, a distinctive uh, uh, historicism in his work at that, at that time. But it was, you know, it was uh, 1894. Um, so I think it took him, it took, it took some time for him to arrive at more uh, modernism, so to speak. But the, there was always in his work uh, um, uh, duality. It was as if he was looking both forward and backwards. Uh, 
I mean, you know, to inspire simultaneously the traditionalists and the new objectivists, it's, it says a lot, or the school of Amsterdam and the steel, because these were actually, you know, uh, opposite, uh, they represented opposite forms of doing art and doing architecture. I think this testifies about the complexity of uh, Hendrik uh, Berlacher. So this is one of his earliest works. Uh, Villa, of course, he used a lot of brick and the Dutch are excellent working with brick and they use it a lot. And uh, maybe even the paintings of Piet Mondrian could be, could be approximated, uh, uh, you know, at least some of them, uh, maybe the earlier ones, the, the earlier abstract ones as uh, depicting some kind of bricks. Yes, the brick is a magical material and um, it never fails you. Both Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Kahn had the most uh, generous words about the brick and the brick does deserve it, it's true. Frank Lloyd Wright thought that, uh, you know, he asked, give me a brick and I'll, I'll transform it, in it into its equivalent in gold. Uh, while, you know, uh, Louis Kahn even had conversations with the brick, like the famous, I asked the brick what it wants to be, and the brick said, I want to be an arch. Now another villa by Berlache, Villa Henny in, uh, in the, the Hague, the capital of, uh, of the Netherlands. I mean, look at this, you know, it's, I think it's magical. Uh, it's it's it, it's a beautiful interior. It's dramatic. It's um, coherent structurally. Uh, you know, if I would build something like this today, I would be proud of myself. But I don't have this occasion. Towards the exterior, the building has again, like in the previous building that we saw, uh, you know, historicist elements. Uh, but uh, these historicist elements are not uh, necessarily uh, a deficiency. This is how the building looks today. And of course, the interior is as of today, maybe a little bit too polished for my taste and too refurbished, but anyway. A building by Berlache, one of the earliest buildings by him. Now, the first church of Christ, the scientist, well, there is apparently such a church, the church of Christ scientist. What about the first church of Christ artist? Well, maybe I had an idea now, you know, uh, spontaneously. Let's found, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, yes, initiate some steps in this direction. The first church of Christ artist. I'm a little bit tired of the scientists, I, I confess. Okay, here it is. Does it look like a church? Maybe not so much. But being that is the church of Christ, the scientist, maybe then we could accept a little bit, but it could have been a city hall. It could have been uh, many things. If you look at the building uh, and if he didn't have here the wording, uh, you know, you probably would not have known that it is a church or it was a church, probably still is. Um, the, uh, the Netherlands, they have many cathedrals and many churches. I have myself some books here. I was lucky to find them at the secondhand bookstore, Dutch books. And I was amazed how many great cathedrals they have, truly great. Uh, and um, I will talk soon about another dead Dutch architect, Kuipers, who built many, many neo-Gothic cathedrals, quite nice, quite convincing, quite dramatic. Villa Simons, 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 1913 in The Hague again. Um, uh, here we already see elements of uh, unconventionality because of the canopy at the top of the building uh, is uh, rather, uh, you know, unusual. 
maybe it's not so apparent in this view, but uh, you know, from the side, uh, it strikes one as being rather modern, so to speak. But again, the brick world, the beautiful brick world, which almost by itself, you know, if you just build a brick world, it doesn't need anything. It doesn't need an opening. It doesn't even need to be a building. It's beautiful. Why? Because it's it's transformed earth. A brick is a you know is a is is made of earth of clay, and uh, I don't know. I, I'm maybe not very inspired now to to compose ad hoc a poem dedicated to the brick, but the brick deserves it. It does deserve it, and I think great architects never hide the brick behind plaster or anything. No, the brick should be allowed to 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 you know, to, to show itself without the makeup, because it is beautiful like this. I don't know how they do it to protect it from the elements. Maybe the quality of the bricks. I don't know, but. I'm sure there are solutions because many, many architectures and architects use the brick like this, uncovered by anything, without finishes, so so-called finishes. Now, a uh, lodge built in 1916, Saint Saint Cuthbertus Lodge. This is a large building. I don't know why it is called a lodge, uh, but uh, look at this. It's it's uh, it's it's huge. Look. <clears throat> Actually, the, the Dutch have uh, often have, uh, Dudok also has, and, and not only him, there are uh, remarkable Dutch architects who use a very, uh, you know, almost ostentatious vertical, like we see here. Uh, it's like a signal, like, a, you know, like a clock tower. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> We, we cannot really say that it's a, it's a remarkable sense of harmony here or balance because the verticality of the vertical part of the building is uh, rather overwhelming, I would say. But uh, anyway, maybe that's why the, the, how, that's how the Dutch fight the, you know, the problems of living one third of the country under the level of the sea. So maybe that, that verticality expresses their desire to, to live above the level of the sea. I don't know. Hendrik Berlacher, Petrus. Petrus, a beautiful middle name. I am curious why the Dutch do not get tired of so much good architecture. I mean, it's just unbelievable how many great architects they had. And artists, of course, if we are to mention only Vincent van Gogh and Rembrandt, but they had many, many, many others. It's, it's a special country, it really is. Now, this is a museum now. Uh, I don't know what it was initially, but it's one of, of, of the great buildings by uh, uh, Berlache, and this one is a little more modern, maybe more than a little more, a little more, yes. Uh, you see, maybe here you can see some influences coming from across the ocean, uh, but maybe also from within the country. I, unfortunately, I do not know when this was built, but it's, it's definitely more modern than what we saw previously. Although in the plan, I hope I have a plan here, uh, it's very symmetrical, but seen, uh, you know, from a side, uh, it's, it's, it's dynamic, it's uh, cubistic, it's modern. I guess my presentation still uh, needs uh, some improvements. I'm afraid I don't have enough material about this building, and this is one of his most important buildings, in my opinion. Yes, yes, I'm unforgivable for this and I apologize. I should have had more. Um, I think I have another presentation which I, I, I couldn't find or I, I, I didn't even search for with more images because I remember working also with the plans and the sections. Anyway, if you are interested to see this, uh, how is it called? Um, this work in The Hague, 
you just type in museum and you'll come across it, uh, Berlache. It's a good work. It's a good work. It's one of his best works. And he's kept, uh, you know, impeccably. Now, this is a, a city hall. Uh, it's a small building from 1928. I mean, smaller than what, what we just saw. I, in fact, I discovered it only today, and I'm glad I discovered it because I like it, and it deserves to be part of the presentation. So 1928, almost 100 years ago, the vertical is indeed vertical. And if you compare the building on the right with the building that Berlache built, you understand that indeed he was announcing modernity. I mean, there is a distance, a clear distance between the building on the right and the building that he built. You know, when I look at this building, I really, I really uh, appreciate the, the, the contribution of modernity. You know, it's a step forward. It's a it's an optimistic step forward, actually, you know, and uh, without this step forward, we are stuck. You know, it's like living without a horizon of hope. Here I see a horizon of hope, even if modernity passes and maybe passes through crises and difficulties and uh, lack of, uh, uh, you know, self confidence, uh, maybe, but I think we need. We need to push forward. We need the newness of art, the newness of architecture. Uh, without it, you know, it's like uh, being stuck. And uh, the excellence of good art or good architecture is um, continuously uh, opening up new new territories. I mean, this is a 100 years old building, but uh, still somehow, um, you know, I think it's inspirational. And again, it shows the complexity, the greatness of Berlache, because this was the man who inspired the opposite art movements, opposite architectural movements. You are going to see a little bit later a building he built in London that uh, is uh, strikingly uh, powerful and, uh, and uh, original, even by today's standards. Is that building in the vicinity of the famous tower that um, uh, Sir Norman Foster built? An image from the inside, the in interior of, the, of, the, of this uh, city hall. Uh, I like the way they have the uh, seems now they, they are fans. But but the architecture is is uh, fresh, I would say, even for today. Now, of course, you know, the pragmatic and the functionalist would say, did this tower need to be so tall? Probably not. It could have been shorter. But architecture is also about expression. And uh, as such, the architect wanted it tall. And tall it became. OK, another villa. I only have this picture here. You see clearly the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright on uh, Hendrik Perlache. Uh, I didn't find other pictures with this building. I would have been curious to find, but the influence is, uh, is very visible. The influence of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who had a great impact on, on, uh, on Germany and on the Dutch, uh, well, uh, and on other countries, of course. but. First, he, he had a great impact there in Europe. Uh, and they published the first um, you know, significant book on the works of Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, the Peace Palace is a, is a project he did. Uh, it was not built, but I, I chose to show it because I think we need, uh, we need uh, in the present also you know, maybe not palaces, but buildings that um, proclaim the need for peace. 
we should never tire, I think, to fight for peace because it seems the, the, the adverse forces are determined to, uh, uh, you know, attack peace. And this is very, um, very sad. So this is a project, I think he did it for a competition. Uh, he, it was not built. Now, hotel in Hague, or The Hague, um, yeah, it almost looks like a hotel, I guess. Um, very interesting interior, you know, with a very, uh, you know, again, the the work with brick is is uh, is. Um, please be kind and turn off the microphone. I hear um, a, a noise, and you know, since I talk freely, I I make efforts not to say too many stupid things. So it would help if you turn off the microphone, unless you want to say something, and you are very welcome to say. Uh, you see, if here also there are historicist elements. Uh, but uh, all in all, the building has a certain uh, well simplicity, although the interior uh, could have uh, belonged to maybe even a different century. Amsterdam Commodities Exchange. This is maybe his most famous building, uh, and uh, it is a remarkable building. It's a massive building. It has a lot of bricks, one above the other, one above the other. The interior is, is splendid. And look at this. You know, it's uh, <clears throat> architecture with a capital A. There is no need to, to be falsely modest. It's truly architecture with a capital A. You have, uh, you know, uh, uh, this combination between the knowledge of using iron uh, using metal, a metallic structure, you know, with maybe some inspiration coming from Violet Le Duc, I don't know. And then you have the brickwork, you have arches. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a lesson in architecture. And it was uh, given to us by uh, Hendrik Petrus Berlache. And there are all kinds of events that take place in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, a large, uh, large space. So if you arrive in Amsterdam, uh, you you probably will come across it because it's an important building there. Here you see all kinds of things happening inside the, this generous space by uh, Berlache. Amsterdam. I think the, the, the Dutch are so successful in, in, in art and in architecture because they are very open-minded. There is an openness. I mean, even today, you know, we have very important architects who are Dutch, if we are to mention just uh, Rem Kolhas and MVRDV, but there are others, you know, they experiment, they, they, they truly, uh, uh, you know, they are not stuck in a style. They continuously uh, search for new things and, uh, you know, it pays, so to speak. So you have Amsterdam, the city which was not destroyed by the Second World War, and we have Rotterdam, which was destroyed in good, in good part, in good measure, or maybe the word good is not the, the best in this context, it was destroyed in a large percentage. So Rotterdam, the city of the future, and Amsterdam, the city of the past. But the truth is, the Amsterdam is also the city of the future if we are considering just the, the valley, the new addition by NVRDV in Amsterdam, in that uh, large complex of uh, housing units and uh, offices. 
So the, you know, the history loving Amsterdam is actually not at all uh, opposed to, to the new. It's an open society, you know, the, 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 the Netherlands, you know, they, they are open, they are active, they are vital, they are, they are they, 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 there is a, an energy there that I think should inspire many, including ourselves. And the population is not very large, it's actually a little bit uh, smaller, the population of the Netherlands compared to that of Romania. But even here, even if the, there are some elements of modernity, but you also see uh, details, so to speak, which are you know, informed by uh, a certain past. And the, the sensitivity of Perlach allows for that past to um, you know, uh, be simultaneously present with, uh, with the innovative, uh, modernistic, uh, you know, elements. This was the initial plan, and then it became like this, a very large building in Amsterdam. Now the truth is, even the, if even if he is considered the father of modernity in uh, in uh, Dutch architecture, there are other architects who are considered also fathers of the modern architecture, like like Dudo. Um, and so, but uh, back to Berlache, the Holland House in London, which is a very interesting building, uh, and uh, it's not with reddish bricks is this one uh it's uh, let, let's see now this uh, detail you see here in the, the upper left corner the building by sir norman foster so this uh, i want to see a picture the whole of it just a second and then we'll come to the, some details it's incredible well i guess well something you can see it you know here it's still connected somehow with what he did in, in the Netherlands, but um, I think he, he assumed the stringencies of, uh, I don't know if I should call them stringencies of the, of the, of the Londonese uh, urban landscape. It's still different from what he did in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam. I like this building and it's, it's, it's modern, but it's also, it does have, it's not outrageous mo modern. It, it has a, it still has a, a level of modernity, but uh, a level of uh, uh, what we call tradition or traditional elements that are, they are present. You, yeah, it, it's, it's a building that, that somehow belongs to us, but somehow belongs to, uh, you know, uh, before the war in the 20th century, it, 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 it does look both ways. And these are the buildings of Berlach. He, they always do this. And I, I like this fact that it's, it, it's difficult to pin it down as being a modern building. Yes, it's an office building, but, but it has elements like even what is happening here in the corner, you know, it's, which is rather mysterious. I don't know exactly what this mask represents. I don't know if it is a, a, some kind of a fountain. Uh, it's it's uh, monumental, it's mysterious, it's figurative, but it's also abstract. He's an architect uh, uh, capable of, uh, of uh, 
creating uh, you know a certain level of uh, uh, ambiguities i would say the interior is uh, you know uh, pre-modern actually and uh, obviously uh, accommodating what we call ornament he, he he didn't renounce ornament and the truth of the matter is uh, not even adolf loss renounced ornament and uh, i think it's very very important to bring back ornament to architecture and this is actually happening in the present some very innovative architects today uh, like uh, Patrick Schumacher, for example, is, uh, is uh, emphasizing the simultaneous uh, presence of the ornament and structure. The ornament is important. And if we think of the mystical statement by Louis Kahn, that ornament is the adoration, the adoration of the joint, then I think we should consider very seriously um, or reconsider very seriously the ornament. But here we have ornaments on the on the floor. We have ornaments on the ceiling. We have ornaments on the lamps. We have ornaments everywhere. You know, and you could say, okay, but this is an almost one hundred years old building. Well, yes, but also no, because it's it's about continuity. It's not, it's, you know, modernity represents a break, but could represent also a break which is accommodating a certain part of what we call history. Or, or, or look, uh, this facade, it's, it's, it's modern. We could call it modern. It's like you don't even see the windows. It's, it seems to be an opaque facade, but it's not opaque. I mean, it has windows, uh, and uh, I, I, if we didn't see this, you know, or maybe some other so-called details, we, if we only saw this, we'd say this is a very innovative and very modern building. Well, it could be seen in this way, but it could be also seen like negotiating between what we call the past and what we call the present, or even the future. And what is this? You know, it's um, it's mysterious. I, I I think this says something about the contemplative nature of Hen Hendrik uh, Berlache. You know, uh, it's it's a work of fantasy in a way. You know, it's fantastic. It's mysterious. You don't know exactly what it is, but. Uh, it's engaging, it gives character, it gives personality to the building. Is this a self-portrait maybe of uh, Henrik Berlache, a cryptical self-portrait? I don't know, maybe he would not have liked this interpretation. And it's true, it was not very flattering, but I just thought of it. Anyway, the interior, it is as it is, all kinds of ceramics. And again, you know, it's, it's the brick, the ceramic, the clay, the clay that, that generated this, uh, um, you know, uh, covering here, because it is a covering. Maybe even some influences from a very remote past, like um, Mesopotamia. But look at the, look at the, look at the surprise of, of, of this facade which was built uh, you know uh, more than 90 years ago or so I, I think it's remarkable it really is Hendrik Berlacher Petrus Berlacher sorry I don't know exactly how the shadow fell on this, uh, that this picture was taken, but isn't it interesting? I think it is. Now, a Swiss hotel, and like any Swiss hotel, is probably an expensive hotel in Amsterdam. 
Well, it was uh, transformed. I mean, it was, I don't know if initially it was a hotel, uh, they refurbished it and, uh, you know, they put the Swiss, uh, Switzerland flag there and uh, it's probably expensive and very comfortable and very civilized and very clean. Uh, it's not an, one of my, of his, uh, it's not one of uh, my favorite uh, buildings by uh, Berlache, but he built it. And the uh, view from the inside after the refurbishment, uh, you know, it's, um, what can we say? I, I don't know if some dramatic changes perhaps didn't take place here. It's possible that they did, I don't know. Now, this building is uh, interesting and, uh, you know, once you become a little bit familiar with the work of uh, Henrik Berlacher, uh, you see a relationship between this building and the building in London. Um, you know, he uses uh, the grid, uh, he, you know, the regular rhythm, but uh, I wouldn't call him a rationalist, no, because he articulates the identical parts with uh, with certain details, if we are to call them so, which show a sensitivity that is beyond uh, beyond rationalism. But it's it you know if I am to express myself in, in maybe in a banal way, I would say in his work there is a an equilibrium between feeling and reason. Uh, reason is shown uh, through, you know, the regularity of, uh, of the composition and then feeling is shown through the materials he uses through some details, a romantic disposition, especially inside the building. We are going to see a little bit later, and this is not going to be a very long presentation, uh, but uh, in a few minutes we'll see a very, very interesting work where you see a lot of uh, uh, spatial, uh, 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 a lot of disposition for uh, a sculptural uh, interior, um, you know, vertical uh, space that animates in a sculptural way uh, the building. But towards the outside, you know, even here, the building is, um, it's hybrid, you know, it's, it's, it's both modern and traditionalist. And I think this is Berlake. Uh, I like this building again. I think it's it, it's 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 architecture. Yes, sounds maybe predictable and banal, but with a capital A. Yes, it is. It's not a cathedral, but it's a building built for men on this earth, which has dignity, which has sensitivity, and which has bricks again. And you know, from far away, you could say uh, it's a building that. Uh, no, no, it, it has touches of, of history, of tradition, it does, but not uh, in an in a, you know, uh, embarrassing way at all. Now, this building in Amsterdam from 1898 to 1900, this is an early work by him. I, I should have had them in a chronological order. Well, what is surprising about Berlache is that I take much of my information from Wikipedia, well, both the British, I mean, the, the English, uh, you know, language uh, Wikipedia and the Dutch uh, language uh, Wikipedia don't show a list, a chronological list of his works. So um, it's, it's hard to create a material uh, that is rigorously chronological, but maybe this is somehow connected with the spirit of his work which has, uh, you know, ambiguities, uh, uh, hybridity, and so on. Look at this, uh, what is happening at the interior of this building. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's very convincing structurally, and it's very convincing ornamentally, both. So the contemplative man that we saw at the beginning of the presentation in those photographs shows himself because in a way a building, a good building is in a way a self-portrait of the architect. Uh, 
it is so. Hendrik Petrus Perlache, <clears throat> happy birthday to you, sir, today. Again, the love of bricks and colored bricks and so on is, is, is obvious, it's for all to see. And he knew how to handle it very, very well. He was also not, um, you know, uh, shy to, you know, heavily cover the walls with uh, ornaments. Yes, ornaments. So do we only have white walls? I think this is a splendid interior. The outside is uh, maybe not announcing uh, the riches that you discover uh, uh, inside. Now, We'll end this presentation, which is uh, still a uh, work in progress. Maybe next year, if I continue to do this, or I, uh, someone like him, I celebrate twice on the day of the birth and on the day when he died. So I will continue to work on it because he does deserve um, more attention and he has other works, I imagine. Although I try to go through all of them, but. Uh, as I said, the information about him is maybe in books, I can find more, but I don't have books on Berlache. Anyway, I will end this presentation with furniture design because he designed a lot of furniture, like other great architects who also designed a lot of furniture. And the chairs, of course, occupy a, a significant place uh, in the realm of uh, furniture design. Here they are. We begin with this, uh, you know, uh, rather funny uh, chair with three legs and with a triangular seat. Is it the most comfortable chair in the world? Probably not, but it is one of the interesting chairs in the world, yes. And architects design uh, often uh, chairs which are maybe a little bit problematic in the field of comfort but uh, engaging aesthetically. Frank Lloyd White was complaining uh, later in his life that he had a certain pain in a certain part of his body because he sat for too long on his own chairs, meaning designed by himself, by him. Here is another chair, um, very different from the previous one, but we see the sculpturalness uh, that uh, a good designer cannot uh, move away from here as well. He, he, you cannot separate function from form. You know, it's form that gives you pleasure, really. You know, even if the function is my saying, no, I'm sorry, I, my pleasure derives from a beautifully, uh, comfortably conceived uh, object or building. But um, Architecture is a visual art. You need to address the visual. It's impossible not to. Now, this thing obviously needed, uh, you know, the cushions, but um, it, it is interesting even like this, you know, like a massive uh, piece of wood that is supposed to receive a few uh, users on it. This, this chair is interesting, inspired by, uh, you know, Egypt probably, very, you know, very well crafted. And um, I, I would have liked to have such a chair in my proximity. Of course, I would not have dared to sit on it 
this is a chair to look at, not to sit on, although it's very solid, you can tell. Berla has. Architecture, furniture design, design in general. These are beautiful activities, but they are beautiful only to the extent they are creative. If they are not creative, um, they could be truly painful. Now, this is maybe not so creative, unless we consider the little wheels at the bottom. I don't even know if he proposed them like this or made them like this. This chair uh, is uh, you know, similar to the first one we saw. Uh, uh, architects like, uh, like triangles. And uh, in this case, the triangle has uh, uh, you know, uh, resoluteness, which is um, balancing uh, some decorative elements in a way. But it's an interesting uh, piece nevertheless. Another one, that is another chair. And the throne, this is a throne. It's, I don't know if it's for an Egyptian king or for a prince or a princess, but um, it, it does have charm. Thank you, and uh, happy birthday, uh, Hendrik per, uh, Petrus Berlacher. 